Let's kick it off. Yeah, let's introduce uh, Shiraz Ahmed. Um, Shiraz is a, a portfolio manager and advisor at uh, J Raymond James, but really Satorial Wealth is your brand, right? Correct, it is. Brand you come up with. And uh, yeah, Shiraz and I go back a long way. I was trying to think of the day, the year that we met. Um, it was pretty early on in, in my career at Blackmont, which is probably Blackmont, 2000, yeah. 2007, 2000, 2006, 2007, likely. Something yeah. like that. When you were working for the, um, what was it called, Bullion Management Group? That was even before that. I think I met you when I was at NEI. Okay. So it was actually Northwest Fund's pre-merger, so it was a really long time ago. So 2006-ish, I think. Right, right. And then we, uh, you know, we were we were similar age groups, uh, you know, similar ideas of how we wanted to grow our respective businesses. We were sharing, um, we were actually workout partners for a while doing the kickboxing at uh, TKMT in Toronto, right? Remember that? Totally, yeah, up at Young and Egg, that was awesome. A lot of great exchange of ideas over over their time and what I really wanted to start off with, first off, I'd like to get you to introduce yourself a bit more, but um, you know, I think Shiraz is one of the, uh, one of the few people I've met in the business that is really a sponge that is able to absorb many different perspectives from anybody that he speaks to and actually apply them and make them work. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what you've done on on building your business as an advisor and the social media side. But before we begin, why don't you give us a little bit of your background and uh, and we can go from there? Sure, absolutely. No, first off, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, definitely good crew. So, I mean, my background, uh, associate portfolio manager and financial advisor was Satoria Wealth of Raymond James. That is my registered trade name with the regulators. Uh, I'm a bit unique in the industry and in then I'm actually a fully dual licensed advisor. So I carry an IROC affiliation in Canada and also Phil, FINRA affiliation in the United States. So uh, what's a little bit different about myself is that 50% of my practice is actually south of the border. So it's unlike most of my counterparts, uh, which gets into really cool stuff. So. Um, I've just prided myself, like you mentioned, as being a bit of a sponge. And my whole mantra in life has been uh, packing as much life experience in as short a time as possible. So I had the unique benefit of meeting 1,500 advisors in my career. Uh, actually, that circled the globe as well. So I quite literally built my practice by watching a lot of other people do it, in my opinion, not the right way. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you were, when I was chatting with you, you were going to Saudi Arabia and, uh, um, you know, uh, traveling all over the world, traveling all over Canada, really getting to understand the, the investment business. And we chat, this is at a time where you were, um, you were wholesaling in the beginning of your career, right? Correct. But it was clear to me that you should be an advisor because you were educating those guys and, and including myself at the time, um, better than most advisors could do that I'd met, right? So I was, I think I was constantly pushing you to, to get into that. Every day, especially after kickboxing for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what year did you decide to, because you're, you're in this, you've been very successful in the, in, in the wholesaling space, but certainly you've been a bit of a rising star in, in Raymond James. It's not long ago that you decided to take the leap, no? No. So uh, it's fairly recent. So I, I, again, I went down that path on the wholesale side of the business for about 11 years. And then I kind of went full circle. So just full disclaimer, I actually started off on the advisory side to begin with in the beginning of my career in 2002, 2003, um, working for another advisor who to this day is actually my mentor today. Um, funny enough. So I went full circle. I went and on the wholesale side, learned from the best of the best on what I like to call a very well oiled machine, which is on the wholesale side of our business. And then I came full circle and I came over here and I started in, I think 2013, 2014 was when I started at, at Raymond James. So can't believe it. it's been a whirlwind. I feel like I just blinked my eyes, but uh, you know, they say it takes uh, 10 years to become an overnight success, right? So uh, here yeah. we are seven years later. And when you first started um, in the program, was the advice that you were getting, the, the typical advice that I got when I first started getting into the business in, in 2005, 2006, which is, if you want to grow your business, there's only one way: it's smile and dial. Pick up that phone and call. Um, was, I mean, that was my experience. But you, having started it again a bit later, was that the type of uh, advice you got? And uh, and how did you break away from that, or did you even bother to do that in the beginning? Uh, great question. So um, I did that historically in my career. So when I was at the beginning, 2002, 2003, working for the advisor at Waterhouse, that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. I smiled and dialed with the best of them. And I know that I'm capable of doing it and doing wholesaling for a long time and inside sales. That's a big part of the job. 
Uh, but I liked it. I mean, I'm so sick and tired of doing that that I didn't want to do that. So when I came over here, that's obviously one aspect of what you can do to grow a business. But I elected right from the get go. I'm never going to cold call. And to this day, I haven't. Nice. So um, it's I was fortunate. I had a really good teacher. Um, so my whole way of building my business has been ultimately cultivating champions. Uh, so it's not really anything innovative and new. It's just more applying my 11 year skill set in this side of the business. So again, wholesaling is a well oiled machine. And that's something that I'm intimately familiar with because of how long I did it for. So all I've done really effectively is take the best of the best from that side of the business and apply it on the advisory side. And all of a sudden it took a little bit of lead time, but then it the stars started aligning and things have been going really well. Yeah, yeah. So, so say more about what that is. So um, effectively, I could, I could just hear a number of people who do that in their day to day life, just saying a breath of relief, saying you can actually do that. I, oh, I don't know how. So I'd say, look, your, your typical wholesaling team is comprised of three people. You'll have the external wholesaler, you'll have an inside salesperson, and then you'll have like a territory coordinator or uh, an assistant. Um, now, I've done all three of those jobs, right? So I literally started at the bottom and worked my way up. Um, so all I've done is effectively try to recreate that on my side and a lot. I was basically forced to scale up faster than most people who were in my chair would. I had to put my money where my mouth was, which is another really tough thing to, for a lot of advisors to do. Uh, as my mentor always jokes, we're all like T-Rexes, right? We can't reach our wallet. Um, so realistically, that's effectively what I had to do uh, is consciously not be cheap and invest back in my business and back in myself. And you have to spend money to make money. Now I didn't have a lot, so I had to get really creative on how to stretch a dollar but effectively um, create that three uh, stage system where, you know, if I'm a big golfer, so golf is a lot of my analogy. So one person's the tee, another person's the ball, and I'm just the driver. My job is to show up and knock it out of the park. So ultimately, once you got those pieces in place, and it took a couple of years to get it, but once I got that, then all of a sudden, you know, really the paradigm completely shifted and we became one of the faster growing practices in the country. Well, specifically though, what is what does cultivating champions mean? So, so that's the structure I'm assuming that you had to set up in order to uh, journey along the the path of of cultivating champions. But I think I know what you mean. But it doesn't matter what I think. I want to know what you mean. Sure. So, effectively, again, it's going back to my wholesaling roots. So, when you're when you're speaking to an advisor, when as a wholesaler, you're really just you know, for lack of a better, and I don't want to say anything negative about anybody, but most of these things are the same thing, just with a different bow on top, right? So it's all relative value for the most part. It's, do you want my Canadian equity fund or are you going to buy the guys next door, right? You're going to buy one of them. So which one are you going to buy? Um, so really it's all about developing that deep relationship and, and getting that um, champion or that individual, whoever it may be, and they come from different walks of life. My primary are ultimately CPAs, so accountants across North America, um, but not exclusively. That's just by my bread and butter. Um, but getting those types of people to engage back in you and effectively solving a problem for them. Uh oh. Yeah. I knew I, I knew it was going to be a good idea. of us are trained. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, you, you just have the magic stuff. <laughs> no, no, so it's, it's you pulled your cable out and you're like, I'm not telling everybody this stuff. Here's, <laughs> yeah. the, here's <laughs> the secret stuff I My put bad. in. Yeah, it's the, yeah. I can't. Yeah. And I'm going through and a tunnel. Of course, all the magic. clients show up at the door. That's, <laughs> so that's how you do it. Now keep going. So, so you're at the uh, point you were dealing with CPAs, so niching a bit and then adding value or solving problems. Yes. That's where you got to cut out. So keep going. Definitely. So you basically you add immediate value to somebody. And, and most of us are unfortunately in our training taught to say, look, I want to ask for the business immediately. Right. And I actually think that's the wrong way to do it. So what I like to do is I like to give first unselfishly. Right. Try. How can I help you do your job better? So whether that be maybe even teaching some of them how to sell themselves. Right. Maybe even just rearticulating the conversation or at minimum fixing a specific problem. So because of the cross border nature of what I do, uh, I can do stuff that other people can't. And they've historically had this problem. It's just a drag in their in their books. Any client that happens to reside in Canada that has a W-9 has this problem. And so I'm uniquely positioned to fix that specific problem. So it's almost like a light bulb moment for them. It's like, oh, you can do that. Awesome. Tell me. I, I love that. Um, position yourself to do something that other people can't or that very few can. I mean, that is, I think if I, if I think about a lot of the, the folks that try a niche market, they're, they're not thinking in that way, right? They're not thinking about having a very direct and measurable point of difference that 
is whether it's a regulatory point of difference. I'm assuming because you can deal on both sides of the border for an individual client and you're familiar with the forms that they may be facing, the troubles that may be facing, you can have a more, a deeper, more meaningful conversation. And then you can actually bring solutions to bear from both sides of the border. Is that, is it, am I, is that the leap or? hundred percent. Yeah. So th what I mean by we can do things that others can't, for example, uh, Americans that moved to Canada, unfortunately, securities laws in both countries are residency based, but the United States is one of three countries on the planet that have a global taxation or a global reporting requirement for citizens yep. or what we call U.S. persons. So you can be yep. a green card holder or a citizen. So because of that, there's actually a conflict is that uh, the, my best analogy is imagine a retirement account like a cement pole in each country. OK, and your, your non retirement accounts are like luggage. They have to go on the plane with you to country jurisdiction. But those cement poles are still fixated in the ground in that country. So you were earned that while you were legally a resident, you're entitled to keep it. You just need to be with an advisor and an institution that's licensed to keep you. And unfortunately, there's very few that have that. So I happen to be one of the handful of people in North America that can fix that problem. So if you have that, and unfortunately, a lot of the American institutions, the moment that that person moves over the border, they send them this Dear John letter that says, you have 60 or 90 days, get out. And or or here's a check, and you can pay the tax. So and so so you're, you're you're networking with the the other professionals that they would engage with, making sure that they know if they encountered this problem that you're there to help them service their client, provide any sort of transitionary period, operate with both sides. You're doing two tax returns in this case, and in, in, in almost all cases, so you've got to liaise with two different tax professionals with two different uh, domains of of um, rules and knowledge. And so that that's you're doing what other people can't do. Is that, and and look, from a, from a broader perspective, I think, you know, you found a niche. There are many niches that people listening that want to grow their business can find it. I mean, I remember uh, when I spoke about my niche at the time, which was I needed people that could read the, what I wrote, which was a lot of stuff and long form. And the vast majority of people don't have time, nor do they care except for one unique group that spends most of their day reading and that those were lawyers, right? Attorneys in the US. And, um, and so I spent my time like contacting them and sending them long form content that they would read from soup to nuts and then buy in, right? That, that was my niche. But like that there's so many areas that individuals can try to attack. And people tried to, people would look at me and say, okay, I'm gonna do that. And they tried to do the same thing I did, but because of the way I marketed and, and really pushed my brand out at the time, um, they weren't as successful as I was, right? And similarly, I know a lot of, a handful of advisors that do what you do, but have not even come close to the growth that you, you have. Um, because I think that you, going back to the sponge example, and I'd like to, you to expand on how you were able to do this, um, you market yourself better. I think one of the things that I wrote in the in, uh, on the headlines of this uh, this uh, podcast uh, YouTube live show was that you how do you brand yourself as a as your unique self right You seem to me like really genuine. One of my favorite things that you do is the um, uh, the car diaries or the, the <laughs> what is, it? is that the car diary? Yeah, the car chronicles. Oh that my god! When I when I start seeing that, I'm like, to you, start doing it. This is not a Raymond James advisors thing that gets done. Like this is, how, how did you even, how did you come up with that idea? And then how did you even get it through a large um, wire house to allow you to do that? And why don't you give me a little bit of background? Because I think sure. that was very unique, especially as a wire house advisor. Absolutely. So uh, first of all, it wasn't easy. Um, so again, Demographics of our business, I think, is a big part of it. So I'm on the younger end. I mean, I'm in my late 30s at this point, but you know, the vast majority of people who sit in my chair um, don't look like me. They're a lot older, typically. They're in their late uh, mid to late 60s, usually. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, as a digital native, this is something that I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to communicate with people where they are. I think a lot of professionals become a little bit selfish and like kind of dig in as to, this is how I used to do it. But the reality is, people nowadays, this is where they communicate, right? So who am I to tell them to communicate in any other way? Let me go where they are. So that was the premise behind how I started going down this path. And then the car videos is frankly for me to get out of my comfort zone. That's a, a it's a space where I was by myself and I could just kind of talk. And it was frankly dead time. Like I live 55 kilometers away from where I work. 
So I had a lot of time in the car. So why not use it productively? That's actually how it started. Um, and again, there was no judgment. There's no other people looking at me. It was literally just me and my car just kind of rambling on for about an hour. And then yeah. I kind of cut it into something that was usable for about a minute afterwards. Uh, but that's effectively how it started. So what, what, and I think what's key about that is you got to try things and see what sticks. But I remember seeing that it, 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 for those of you, uh, you brought, nobody's maybe a lot of people haven't seen this, but you had your phone kind of at a down angle somewhere down to the bottom right. And it was a, an awesome shot, just like your phone. You, it wasn't lots of post-production. It wasn't a lot of bells and whistles. It was your Apple phone with this kind of awesome angle. And you were driving, staring at the road while talking, giving your thoughts. And, and the thoughts that you, what you were able to edit afterwards were fantastic. But this is, it, it's a low barrier to entry, but it, it does mean you're putting yourself out there um, emotionally. I guess it's a tough thing to do, but it doesn't need to cost you a lot of money you don't need to have you know massive scripts written out before you do stuff like that and again i thought it was it may have i may not have thought it was that novel if you were an entrepreneur your own pm but you were part of a larger organization and for you to have done that um kind of opens the door for a lot of a lot of other wirehouse of us to do similar thing so I'm, sure record, I'm not doing a lot of those anymore so the car thing no. just with the legalities of it is kind of a gray area so i've stopped it intentionally for safety oh, okay. reasons but uh, I did about like 70 of them. So it's not like I did, yeah. I did a lot. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, I think it's done with the car but, for now. But you did, you, you've moved on with a lot of podcasting, interviews, right? So you kept on moving that ball forward. Totally. You described it as getting uh, outside of your comfort zone, but you struck me as a pretty good communicator. You, you seemed like a natural. Why was that getting outside of your comfort zone? Uh, so... I mean, we all have our insecurities, right? I mean, I, I have them as well. And one of the challenges that whenever you're recording something, so let's say my office at the office, uh, when I'm in, you know, like when I'm in my home office, but my office, you know, it has glass windows. And it's this thing where everybody literally just peers in and looks at what you're doing, especially because I'm always the guy that's charging forward with something new and innovative. So I always find prying eyes and I find it very distracting. So uh, for me, it was just easier to start off in the car. And you're right, I'm, I'm not really that shy, but you know, every now and then it does come up where you're like, okay, well, was that weird? And I am putting myself out there like Rodrigo said. So it took a little bit of, of being okay from an emotional standpoint to say something and be okay with it and put it out there. And you know, once it's on the internet, it's on the internet, it's there for life, right? You can't get that back. So you had to be comfortable and, you know, stand up at night knowing that, look, I'm, I'm okay with what I just did. Yeah. Well, th those are the type of things that I think lead, you can find a niche market, but if you're not being your authentic self, you're missing out. Like you, you, you're not going to grow as much as, um, as you could. And so I think that's one of the things that, uh, that I think you've been able to, to do with the content that you're putting out there. And you're putting out a lot of content too. You write a piece every Friday. Um, what, what other tools are, are you using these days from, from marketing yourself and your team? Cause you've got a pretty solid team as well. Absolutely. So that's part of where you can, I, I don't think I could do this without the team point number one, right? So part of it was an evolution. So we do usually one anchor piece of content. So that's usually a video uh, on a weekly basis. And then we'll post either infographics or memes, uh, something unique every single day. And one of the challenges that we face is that, you know, as an industry, we're designed around content uh, curation. So pre-approved cre curated content, but I'm a content creator. So there's kind of at times a little bit of butting the heads, but in general, I mean, I've been really fortunate. Raymond James is such a phenomenal firm and a very entrepreneurial place in general, and they see the upsides, but of course, while being, you know, keeping painting between the lines, right? Being okay from a regulation standpoint. So they, I've been fortunate that I've been in a, at a place that allows me to do this and you know, allows me to express myself and to new markets that frankly they haven't been tapping into. So it's been amazing. I don't think I could have done this anywhere else. How, how have you found that with, with respect to any any brand conflict, any conflict coming from, you know, we prefer that not come out of a a, uh, a Raymond James. I, let's not use the name. I don't want to offend anybody. It's not it's not meant for that. Just it's a real question for other practitioners who are operating within a larger brand. And so now you've got your brand and you've got the firm brand and now you've got to navigate that. Um, navigate that matrix do you, do you have any sort of advice for folks on how to do that how to stay pure to your brand but manage within paint within the lines is there any kind of boots on the ground um advice you can offer others in a similar situation to you that are trying to do the same thing 
Uh, sure. So I'd say it's a couple things, right? So number one, know what the rules are, like what can and can't you do? And you know, if you've ever read any of these regulations, they're written pretty ambiguously on purpose, I think. They're open to interpretation, right? So every dealer, member, firm, or wirehouse has their interpretation of what these rules are. So in Canada, for example, the rules are actually fairly loose. They say that you can use social media, but there's archiving, supervision, other things that they have to do, right? So every dealer member firm will interpret that and do it their way. So, so long as you're playing in the frame of what they'll allow you to do, um, push the envelope a little bit, right? So do the max in which you're allowed to do as a starting point and get buy-in from people, right? Like I put my money where my mouth is and I charge for it. I didn't ask for anything until I was much further along. Like, look, I've done 70 of these now. Like, hey, I want to start pivoting into some other stuff, right? So the biggest piece of advice that I can give anybody is just don't be shy about trailblazing. Like I'm routinely steps ahead of almost everybody. So, you know, your earlier question that you asked was, you know, what was that experience like at, at a major wirehouse? Well, I'm probably 15 to 20 steps ahead of just about any one of my counterparts. So half the time there isn't really like a hard rule because they're like, oh, we haven't encountered that yet. So you're kind of making the rules as you go along with obviously the regulators and compliance departments, but it, it's by no means is it easy, but you have to be willing. And as my branch manager routinely tells me, which I totally agree is, you know, people are going to be kind of grabbing at your legs all the time as you're running forward, right? You just have to have this internal strength to keep going right? And, and not stop. You might get derailed and not, you know, the head trash will, will, will be there, right? Somebody's going to try to get in your way and you just have to get creative. I'm like, okay, I can't go this way. Let's find another way around. So how much time do you spend on, uh, on the content that you're putting out? Like, what is that? What does a typical day or week look like for you as you're, you, you have your responsibilities for clients, right? You have your portfolio management responsibilities, your due diligence managers that you're putting into the portfolio, and then you have the building of a business and marketing and business development. And what does that look like for you on a weekly basis? So it's usually the recording of the anchor piece, right? So that's a big part of what I do. Uh, again, I'm fortunate that I have a team now behind me as well, who I can actually offload some of the, the I call it the more monotonous part of what this requires. Uh, so they do a lot of the post-production on both the video as well. So I don't edit the videos myself. That's a big thing because that's probably the most time consuming part of all of this. Recording it is easy. It's making it actually, you know, watchable. That's a whole separate story. I saw your gold segment with all the images and the, the, oh. the cartoons. It was fantastic. <laughs> totally. Well, I mean, look at that. that, that Sorry, how, how how much do you record and, and how, how far do you cut it down? So is, like, is it like a 45 minute recording to bring it down to like 10, 15 minutes sort of thing? So it depends. So my, my associate keeps pushing me to just do one long take and then just keep doing it. My I usually like stop it and then start it again. So it might actually be like 15 tries uh, to do it, but it, it depends on the day. Some days I'm flowing better than others, but uh, that's usually a big part of it is that that, that anchor. And then obviously getting a meme or other things kind of organized around that content. Ideally, they're kind of, you know, related. So it's that way you're not posting something about gold and then something totally about real estate the next day. I'm trying to avoid that, have at least kind of a theme on a week to week basis. Uh, it's not perfect, but you do as close as you can uh, and then just keep running. Right. So, yeah, I, sometimes they're long and I just chop them up uh, into something usable or sometimes just, you know, short snippets. and I just keep re-recording until I get it right. So do you do any, uh... Uh, Sorry. These are dailies, daily videos that you're uh, trying to keep a theme a week. Um, so it ends up being with the regulatory approval process. Like it's not fast. So even if I I could record one every single day, but there's no way this it just takes way too long to get these things up. So realistically, I'm I'm recording usually one video a week, and then the other pieces kind of surround it. Like it's it's every single day there's something unique going up. So that means that every single day there is marketing work being done. Um, not always by me, but at least as a starting point, the video, we, we try to aim for one a week. I think that's a really good point, um, Chiraz, is that if you do a good anchor piece of content, it will serve as a spinoff for many other pieces of content that you'll be able to propagate in your business and, and serve to um, give you multiple opportunities to share that content. Uh, do, do you do that? Is that what you're saying? Or is that something that, um, can you expound on that? Absolutely. So that, that's effectively what we try to do uh, as much as possible. So the theory is, and again, I, I didn't create it. This is coming from the Gary V's of the world, right? Where you do that one long form anchor piece and then effectively that serves and you can license and dice it a bunch of different ways, depending on the platform that you're using. So we have a couple that are approved for use. So we try our best to cater them so that they're as appropriate for that specific platform as we can. 
Um, but yeah, you're right. That's that's really what we do is we have that anchor piece that is the theme call it for the week. And we try our best to keep it to that theme. And then all the memes and everything else kind of go. We, we try to give ourselves about three to four weeks lead time. So I'm recording what I'm recording now this week will probably not air for three or four weeks. Right. So you got to do that. So. Yeah. And do you think of the the audience? Are you doing this for, for the majority of your direct clients or are they for your referral network and, and the sources and the CPAs that you're dealing with both? How do you think about that? So it's technically all of the above, right? So really okay. it's kind of whatever floats your boat, right? So I've done things that are more like personal business branding type stuff, you know, psychological stuff of building a business to also like a video specifically on gold, right? So it's kind of like whatever tickles your fancy, right? So sure. you can do a little bit of everything. And I'd say the biggest thing is like Rodrigo said earlier, express your personality, right? Own it. And if it's true and it comes from passion, then it will show. And then do you have, we have a, a one question is, did you have like a general, uh, could you give a description of who in the team is responsible for what or, or help um, provide? So basically, can you flesh, flesh out or assign functions of the three members of your team? Also, I, I'm assuming you might be outsourcing some of this. So it might not be that your team is doing video editing or doing the print up. It might be that you're you're outsourcing that, but I, I think it would be useful to the folks viewing um, to get an understanding of how how you brought structure to this. I think that people really they say I want to do it, and then they sit there in front of a blank page, and they're like, ah, I don't know what to do, and then you just say, do something, of course, and you'll figure it out. But I think it's helpful if you if you provide a bit of an example. I think others would would uh, benefit from that. Sure. So I'll do my best. Um, so yeah. if I think of myself, I, I, I what I very lovely to say on the team is that I'm, my job is just to be the pretty face, right? So I'm a quote unquote, the actor, right? Check. Uh, yeah. Check. Job so I'm going to 10 out of 10. Show yeah. up and, and <laughs> literally just record and, and, you know, bestow the knowledge or whatever it is that like you either need to entertain people or educate people. Right. So I try to do one or the other in my videos, ideally both. Um, and then I record it. And ultimately I give it to my associate grant who will then go and do the post-production. So he effectively acts as director and producer, right? And that's kind of his role on the team to do that. And then I have my, my assistant Sarah, but she's more on the op side running the business side of things as well. So she doesn't get involved as much on the social side other than maybe just getting a, another set of eyes. And every now and then I'll get my wife because my, my litmus test for stuff is will my wife watch it? And if she won't, because she has zero interest in this side of things. So if she will watch it, then it's probably okay. So that's right. that's usually my uh, my way of doing it. Do, do you include Utrid of Bevenberg in there? Because that's what my <laughs> wife watches. It. That's that's basically all she watches. But anyway. sure. And I'm not going to pretend like I haven't seen all of them because I totally have. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so so sure, let's let's keep on digging in. Um, so we focused on the marketing and and uh, sales aspect, but there's other roles. Like again, going back to my original question, what does your week look like? Who handles what aspect of the business? Because I know. Grant does a little bit of the portfolio construction side. So walk through just how you build, how do you run the full business that you're currently building? Absolutely. So um, I've kind of labeled us in a couple of different ways. So my job is kind of more strategy, CEO, business development. Like that's my job is to bring in the money, I call it the rainmaker in some capacity. So that's usually by doing content creation and then also proactively meeting with a lot of our champions on a regular basis in addition to um, also helping on the onboarding process of the client. Um, one of the things we had to do is, is revamp. We are so process driven in my business. That's the only way uh, we've been able to actually keep this up, um, especially with the requirements of what clients expect from you in today's age. You used to be able to get away with just doing the investments. Now I got to do planning, estate, tax, cross-border. I have to do 10 different things for equal, if not less money than what people used to make, right? So you just got to be more efficient. So. I would then pass it off to my associate who will then help and additionally on the onboarding process as well. And then ultimately my assistant who then runs a lot of the ops on the background. So day-to-day -day activity, um, we are so process driven that even our portfolios are very much model based as well. So most of our clients, while it is very bespoke on the front end, on the planning front, most people will fall into call it the 32 different permutations and combinations that we currently have. Under rare circumstances, will it be one of the ones that are not there? Um, so everything that we do is templated and that's again by design. So my business is completely on purpose. So everything that we're doing is that, so it's repeatable and scalable. And that was the one thing that I always knew that I needed to do is make it so that I can scale and run fast. Cause if you can't, then you're just gonna be dead in the water and, you know, looking at Bloomberg all day. And that's totally not what I want to do. So we, we have different people doing different things. Grant does a lot of the, uh, you know, 
analytics and then also acting as fully the associate on the team. And my assistant, Sarah, does a lot of just sort of the admin and then ongoing client management as well. So she's really kind of driving the front end with the client as well once they've been onboarded. Very neat. Very neat. I mean, these are everything that you're talking about is from the, the classic entrepreneur like playbook, right? You have to uh, you have to build it to scale. You have to have operations that are uh, tight so that you're not constantly just taking in unique snowflakes. Now you, you said you have 36 different models because I guess you're doing financial planning and all that stuff, but at least you have a model fit for a wide variety of, well, sadly end, ends up being a unique snowflake type of business, but that does not mean that you can't template it out in, to a certain degree where you can, you can deal with those unique snowflakes in models that you can yeah, then 36 actually. models allows for quite, quite a bit of granularity. I was going to say, well, that's, that's private. Let me, that. let me get a little bit more granular, right? So there's really effectively three strategies, right? Like I run a Canadian based strategy. I run an American strategy and then I ultimately run a uh, direct equity strategy. So there's actually really only three, but in order to satisfy our regulatory environments, uh, we have to slice them and dice them a bunch of different ways for you know the little old ladies with very conservative risk tolerance and then somebody who's super aggressive speculator as well. So it's the same strategy sliced and diced a bunch of ways. So realistically, there's three main sets of securities, if that's what you're asking. So there's three main. Yeah, so you you kind of have to like the, one of the issues I ran with is that I had, you know, one model. I had one strategy that I really thought was best for clients when I started in, in the retail space. And I, it quickly became clear that this is not a private wealth business. It's an asset management business and had to pivot that way. Um, because if you're private wealth, you do have to account for all the, the specific difference. In fact, you are required to account Correct. for the unique issues for, of every client. And what's what the technologies that, that we have right now available to us or that advisors have available to them right now, it does allow scalability in a way that it, that you couldn't do 20 years ago. Right. Well, yeah, so, this would have been impossible 20 years ago. I mean, when you did it, it would have been a very, well, a lot harder than when I'm doing it now. So, you know, what, what we did ultimately is because it's three main sets of strategies. So one for us people, one for the Canadian people, and then one for those who want, you know, that cross border strategy. And then sometimes there'll be permutations and combinations in between, but, that's really the basics of it. So we're only running really three main strategies, which is completely scalable and it's fo you can focus, right? And then other than that, like you said earlier, the regulators require us to satisfy one major variable, which is sat uh, suitability, right? So I need to make sure that the recommendations that we're making are fully suitable for the individual. So as a PM, fortunately, you can write an IPS. So we wrote our investment policies specific to almost every permutation of client that we currently had. And so that's where all those different versions came from. So we built it from risk first. So yep. the best, the best we, we went back and forth on that a ton before you, uh, you finalize that. Yeah. Before I finalize, like, I mean, the biggest piece of advice you gave me as well was just don't blow up, right? Like that's really the biggest piece of advice I can give to any advisor is you wouldn't just need to stay in business for as long as possible. So if you build it from risk first and make sure that you're putting the client always first, then everything else kind of falls in order. So. I just had to backfill and that's really what we spend a lot of our time doing. So jumping back a little bit to um, marketing, cause I, you know, as compelling as the KYC is, <laughs> I don't know, I, I did nod off there for a second. I'm like, oh, you guys, I can't. Um, what are the, what are the main, uh, what are the main platforms that you find useful? Um, is it, is it LinkedIn? Is it Instagram? Is it YouTube? And then have you um, tried or thought of things like retargeting and, and doing any sort of, uh, purchased advertising in those areas? Have you had any success if you have? So uh, the challenge comes is again, in that ambiguity of the, what the regulations say. So currently we're allowed to use three platforms for social purposes. We're allowed to use LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Facebook for business and Twitter. Um, the other platforms, while they're very viable social media platforms, we're not currently allowed to use. And that's just, a, mm -hmm. it's a line in the sand. It's not coming from the regulators. It's actually coming from internal policies and our interpretation of them. Uh, and I totally appreciate and understand a lot of his supervision requirements. So sure. it's, it's a lot on compliance departments to do it. Like imagine if, you know, one long form piece of video, somebody's got to watch that whole thing and somebody has to prove that thing, right? So if a thousand people all of a sudden start doing that, like you need an army of people just to prove and stuff, right? So I totally get it. Um, but again, that's where technology hopefully will help ease 
So we use those three main. My primary, just given the fact that my largest following happens to be on LinkedIn, that's my primary. Um, and you know, we have well, I think a little over ten thousand or around ten thousand people, so it's pretty good following. Um, and we're just growing every single day. So we get add new people. The challenge with LinkedIn is that you get capped at thirty thousand. So you know, in our current page, really? oh yeah, thirty thousand is the max number of connections you can have on LinkedIn. That's that'll be plenty. <laughs> it's still a lot and it takes time, That'll right? Like, we're, we're adding a couple hundred people a week, right? So like it's yeah. it's it's growing. You're gonna have to start firing connections. That's gonna be amazing. eventually. Actually, it's unfortunate you end up doing. Just I, I want to make that cut. <laughs> totally, of course. Um, go but in, any in in those in those three domains, then any any retargeting, any deeper use of LinkedIn, um, anything of the, the anything you want to share in, the, in those domains where you found it um, successful, or are you just basically using the the basic packages with your content creation and that that's being successful. So it depends if you're asking on the marketing side or the sales, because I think they're two different things. Uh, they're related. Well, they, they're they're definitely two different things. So why don't you tackle one at a time? Sure. So marketing wise, it's more uh, content creation. So putting it out there. Um, recently, we're through the new technology that they've recently implemented. We're allowed to now start using uh, business pages. So that's a newer innovation on our end. So now I'm starting to pump that one up as much as I can. So most of the content that we're posting is going to be reposted and retargeted through my business side as well. Uh, and through the business side, I haven't figured out how to use the ads component, but that's going to be the next piece for us. What is this business pages thing you speak of? LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, you can be a person, but then you can also have a business page. I right. see. Wait, okay, the the the, uh, the company page or the Correct. business page. Yeah. So that, you knew that, Rod. <laughs> we have that, don't we, Richard? We have that tomorrow. Okay, just checking. Yeah. So I use both, and then um, you know, again, Facebook for business. You can use targeted ads. We we have used them as well, and and they're great. You're able to get your a lot more eyeballs on them, and your money goes pretty far away, which is pretty cool. If you think about like a twenty five dollars spend to have your piece of content seen by two thousand people or three thousand people, that's pretty cool. So, you know, and for 25 bucks, I'll do that all day. I remember Especially if you have a niche niche a product where you're not competing with a ton of other people, another reason to go as niche as you can, right? Totally. I'm all about niche, right? So it's funny. It's counterintuitive because you think that by niching, you're going to exclude people. But, you know, I might be the cross border guy, but the amount of people that come to me for just domestic stuff, it's, it's, it's funny. It happens all the time. So they're like, hey, I know you do this, but can you still help me? Right. And then you say, oh, yes, of course. Right. So, right. Right. So, were you looking to pivot into like short form videos, TikTok before uh, TikTok became uh, <laughs> verboten? Well, it's not verboten in Canada, but uh, right but, there you go, yeah, totally. But the cross border might. Yeah, I mean, I'm regulated on both sides. So, how are your dance moves? Because that's cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to see doing the man advice there. while doing the. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you clearly watch it a lot, there, buddy. I'm impressed. Um, we have been we have been introduced to it recently, Mike, and I, I think Mike, you introduced it to me. My yeah, God, I I I'm a, um I I get the uh, the the animal tricks on TikTok are like amazing. I can't even. They're awesome. I mean, I think TikTok my is pet. Cool. <laughs> it's I would cool. love to use it for business. We're just not allowed to do it yet, right? So the, the challenge is that as the financial industry, we're always like five steps behind, right? Because yeah. they got to you know, get the regulation. Well, this, is, Shrez, this is a great question. Cause I've been trying to think of how you might use TikTok. given like it has this, this very limited, it's a very short video. So I'm not totally familiar with it. I'm, I'm a consumer, not a publisher on TikTok. but how might you think that we might be able to use TikTok? Cause I'm kind of, I agree. I'm like, Oh, how would I use it though? And I can't really think of a way. <laughs> Have you so got I think you gotta be interesting, right? So realistically you could either do a lifestyle. So you could either be living like you yeah. guys live, like, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. You talk yeah. about your move, right? So you could do that, right? Or you could just profile specific things. And, you know, in 30, in 60 seconds, you can show a lot. You'd be surprised, that's right? True. And yeah. people's attention spans are so short. So it's either doing something catchy. Remember, educate people or entertain people. Ideally, you're doing both. But if you're pulling to one or the other, you'll always be okay, right? So yeah. you'll be you'll be fine. I, I think you'd be surprised what people would, would, would jump in on. But I think just even showing people snippets of what we do, because they think... They watch Wolf of Wall Street and they think that's what we do, right? Or that's how our it's business not, currently not is. What we do. It's so different. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what's been interesting in this this podcast that we're doing, this live one, has been some of our, of our most popular content, more because when you present a brand like Resolve Asset Management, right? People, you have a certain tagline on your website, you have a certain series of papers that you've written, and you have a uniformity of opinion. 
But of course, when you're inside the machine, there's different opinions. There's tug, there's push and pull. There's there's a lot of, that goes into making that sausage. And I think the authenticity of, of actually having live discussions of disagreements between the partners, the so, the uh, other portfolio managers here, is has been really key in in getting more people to um, to join the fray. So it, it really is that uh, that authenticity that that people wanted to peek into the business, how it is that you know Shiraz actually does his his work. That's what TikTok could be, right? On a day-to-day -day basis, that's what I thought. Like your your car diaries were, right? Oh, they would be perfect for it. To be perfectly frank, those would actually be almost one of the best snippets that I could use for it. But I think just taking segments, you pro you hit the nail on the head, man. It's when you any time you can show your personalities. When people want to know about you, right? Why do you think reality TV is such a big thing, right? We we all crave drama, right? Yeah. So play into it, really lean in wherever you can. So I couldn't agree more, man. Hundred percent. Especially in our industry, right? You're you're supposed to look and dress and speak a certain way and there's all these formalities and then i th i think when when people do get to to see some authenticity and, and, and kind of sort of the backstages and how things really get done and what the thought processes are for some of the decisions i think that i think drives a lot of interest and, and brings a lot of people uh towards your your thinking well yeah this is what we're seeing with the new wave of young advisors right in the us a lot of guys that we know are doing exactly the same thing you're doing and to great success. It's just, it's different. I don't think anybody's like, I made fun of you, both of you guys for having like an unbuttoned shirt and no tie, <laughs> like what, what type of respect. I thought I was getting into, into a conversation with respectable advisors, but uh, here we are, right? It's, you're wearing a polo uh, shirt, Rod. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, but mine's a little higher. I'm not showing the whole, yeah, I'm basically, the so cleavage, uh, on there, buddy. you're showing is a bit too much for my taste, but I'm an, I'm clearly the old guard here. Very conservative. Um, so yeah, that's that's all very neat. But I actually want to want you to continue down the path of of the different technologies that you use. So, so for Facebook, twenty five bucks gets you a ton of of uh, ads. Uh, you have LinkedIn. Um, I don't think you're using Twitter. Uh, as much as anything else, I, I, have I, are you, you are you pushing out a lot of content on Twitter? So we do. So a lot of our content gets pushed out to all of them. Uh, the challenge is so for me of my following, Twitter is the smallest, yeah. I, and I think Twitter's really been changing, right? So it used to be it was one of the, the originals, and yeah. it was very widely used. But you're you're limited in the number of characters you can use, and and Twitter's really good for engagement. So if you want to talk to people, it's for banter, frankly. Right. So for me, it wasn't really where my the type of content that I'm creating isn't almost ideal for it's actually better in other forms. It's actually perfect for YouTube. Uh, it's ideal for LinkedIn now with their whole with the video side. Uh, LinkedIn's challenge is that you can only make videos up to 10 minutes in length. You, you, you can't go over. So if you have this one, for example, couldn't live on LinkedIn, right? Have to live somewhere else. So uh, stuff like that would be well, what I'd be mindful of. But for me, I never got a major amount of traction from from Twitter. But if you talk to Gary V, that's probably like his number one, right? So you know, Twitter is huge if you use it correctly. It's all about community. It's all about engagement, and you have to be on there and be authentic. And frankly, from my end, I just literally don't have the time to do it. I got like like you mentioned, I got ten jobs to do, and there's not enough hours in the day. Yeah, well, we we talked about in terms of the job that you have to do and not enough hours in the day when, we, when you first started going at this and, and asking us about the uh our social media and our and our appearances one of the things that we discussed was consistency right totally because i mean when you first started and when anybody starts you, you don't get any traction you have zero followers right yeah. you're literally talking to the wall and 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 you work really hard at the content that you created to to talk to a wall to talk to nobody at first <laughs> and so you really when you commit to this you have to commit for the long term right you have to be able to say what does this look like three years from now and it's really hard actually to stick to it in the first few months i mean when you first started doing the the content did you ever doubt it did, did you ever decide like we're gonna we're gonna stop i gotta stop all all, all together i gotta pick up the phone and do my old school that smile and dial that i know works did you ever have that moment yeah i mean i'd say every one of us you know I'd, I'd be lying if i said i wasn't like okay well is this working is this a waste of time am i wasting my money like i basically almost had to hire a person to to help me with this which i pay out of pocket right so it, it 
it was definitely we had a, I had more than one gut check moment on whether or not this is a good idea. But like you said, like it's it's, it's like going to the gym, right? You got to you got to pump out the reps, right? You put out the reps. You can't just go in there do it once and expect to get massive, right? It's not going to work like that. You just got to do it and do it consistently, and then over time, eventually, you wake up and you're like, oh crap, that actually started working, right? And it may be that six months in, it still isn't working, and you're like, I don't know. And you have to have this really uh, dispassionate conversation with yourself about: Is this the point of no return where I cut bait and I bail? Or do I double down and do more, right? And sometimes you're almost too close to see it and you might need somebody else to actually say, hey, look, you know what? I think this might not be worth it. Uh, and it's hard and and sometimes we're too close to it. So I'd say this is where having colleagues, counterparts, cohorts, people who you know and trust that can actually just have a dispassionate look like, hey, look, you are going up the wrong tree here, man. This is not gonna work. That's a good Did question, right? That when I, anybody building a business has to ask themselves you want to prov- you don't have consistency of content especially these days right if you want to build a following i mean you're at 10,000 followers in linkedin that didn't happen overnight <clears throat> but um you also you might be having consistency in something that is categorically not working and may never work and so how do you how do you find that line between oh i got to be consistent but also okay that didn't work I'm, i got to move on to the next thing is it just a decision that you're just going to create content and you're iterating on the mediums and the, the consistency is just content or are, are you kind of just doing what, what you can do and, and hope for the best. And then when somebody gives you bad feedback, then you start cutting it. Like what's your, what's your process there? If there is a process. So uh, that's a good question. I, I'd say number one, like anything, do some research, do your homework first. Right. So, you know, if you were to go down, let's say the YouTube path, let's just say for argument's sake, there are people who do financial related. In fact, it's actually one of the highest ones. Uh, number one, for YouTube ads purposes, I think it pays out number one of any of them, for example. Um, but so financial uh, related uh, content index is super high. So clearly there are lots of people doing it. So number one, are is it just you, right? So you need to find out what variable. So like anything from a scientific process standpoint, control one piece at a time, right? Change one thing, don't change 10 things, right? So it, maybe it's just what you're saying, or maybe it's how you're saying it, or maybe it's you, or maybe it's your background. Like you don't know what it is, but you have to keep trying different things and reinventing it a couple of times until you get to a point where, okay, I've been at it for a year or two, I've gone nowhere. And I like, literally, it's not even a measurable move. Then maybe you're, you're going off the wrong path. But if you're having incremental gains over periods of time, like it's not like you have a huge one, but if you had one follower and now you have 10, well, that's a gain, right? So it doesn't have to be a massive amount. It's just that it's trending in the right direction. And you just gotta be open with yourself. Like this is totally not worth it. Like I always just say that if if I valued my time at like a thousand dollars an hour, would I still do that, right? right? It's still worth it. And sometimes it's just to check off, you know, like a checkbox for my ego, or is it like I actually, think that this is going to move the needle for my business. And, you know, that's the hard part is sometimes you need somebody else to tell you when you're just doing this for your ego or if you're doing this for your actual business. Are there are there any KPIs that you look at regularly? And if so, over what time frames would you study those to sort of ascertain what's working and what's not working in order to do more of the former and less of the latter? So I'd say it's, it's more for me, it's viewership, right? So I want to look at what are people, what are the eyeballs spending? And I still to this day, I find it so interesting that there's pieces that I put in so much effort in to make it look pretty. And that's not the one that like, like, I think the best piece I put out in the last year had three words on it. It's check out my new website. Right. And like, I got like 5,000 views on that piece versus that gold video that took me probably a week to make. Right. And all the research and everything that goes into it. And then that got like 1500 views. So I'm like, okay, well, that's not bad, but it's weird. So you don't know what's going to work. So there's a degree of kind of spray and pray where you just got to put a lot out there and it's just reps. So more than anything, you just got to do as much of it as you can for as long as you can until you figure out what works well for you. And I'm still at this point, a couple years in, I still don't know hundred percent what piece is going to do well, right? It's almost kind of relative to what's going on. No, you don't. But what we found is that once you find that, that hot button, you want to press on that for a bit, right? So you don't want to just say, okay, great. Now I'm going to go out and do another piece of content. And that's completely different. Clearly, there's demand for that piece. I think you know what's worked for us is okay. That's popular. Let's split that up into three different separate pieces or episodes or chat about that and and really juice that popular stream 
as much as we can, right? Because it, it is true. These A lot of these topics that go viral are emergent phenomena. You don't know what the zeitgeist is feeling at any given time until they hit you hard. And then you're like, okay, that's where I'm going to focus on. I'm going to continue to, to get my, my viewership and, and um, you know, our following. Uh, and it sounds like it's quite challenging for you to stay current because sometimes a, a topic might pop up and you're like, okay, I got to engage with this. But you're, you, you told us that your compliance process can last up to three to four weeks. So there's quite a bit of a challenge there in terms of, are, are you able to streamline some, some of this and, and get it out sooner if it's a very kind of timely topic that you need to address sort of this week or, or, or next week at the latest sort of thing? Well, absolutely. So let me just rephrase. It's actually typically about a week to get a piece out. Like it really is relative to people like we're in the dog days of summer. So it might take a little bit longer. There's vacations and whatnot. Right. But in general, if we push, we can probably get stuff done in about a week on in overall. So that's not so bad. And very rarely it's just something like so pressing that you need to deal with immediately. Right. right. And, you know, just like any, like imagine a TV show, right? What do they do? They, they batch record, right? They have a season that they pre-record and then it comes out later. So that's kind of the methodology that we've had to implement on our side, just due to real physical constraints of the industry that we're in. So, you know, I would say, imagine that you're running a TV show, right? So if you're, this is your TV show, you're going to pre-record a bunch of episodes and then you're going to release them later. And so they need to be to a degree relatively timeless, but relevant at the time, right? So you can be topical. And as long as it's a two week lead, that's not so bad. I wanted to kind of maybe shift gears a little bit. I was, I, I'm still dwelling on the 36 models. I know it's like three <laughs> themes, but I'm, I'm kind of just a little curious as to on both ends of the spectrum in terms of risk appetite, what does one look like and what is the other uh, end of that spectrum might look like in terms of things that you might hold uh, with the obvious caveat that this isn't uh, none of this is advice, but I'm just kind of curious as to given that you're a guy that seems to be ahead of the uh, curve in the advisor space. I'm just kind of curious as to what your uh, your your clients might be uh, benefiting from these days. Sure. So um, this is going to sound really familiar to you guys because it's really not that different from what you guys do. But realistically, we run target volatility ultimately, right? So uh, originally, I went down the path of trying to do risk parity, and it was really hard to get everybody in kind of one thing, right? So what we found that from a suitability standpoint, I, I imagined that if I had to mark in front of a judge tomorrow to defend, why did you choose X, Y, Z for Mr. And Mrs. Smith? Can I defend it, right? And so the amount of due diligence and analysis that ends up going into running a target volatility strategy, I feel pretty confident I can march in front of anybody and defend it. So what we do is we, we break it down to standard deviation. So an aggressive investor will have a 16 ball, uh, which is a little bit more than market. Well, not this year, but most years, uh, uh, you know, a growthy oriented investor will have a 12% target fall, which is effectively close to what the S and P would normally have. And then I'd say, a conservative investor on the flip side would have a 4% vol, which is similar profile to a government bond. And then we figured a balanced investor would be kind of somewhere in the middle when we decided at about 8%. And what we found is almost all of our clients will come in one of those variabilities. Um, so that's why I'm saying that we're slicing and dicing them a bunch of ways because we have three strategies sliced and diced four to five ways. Right. That's on the risk profile side of things. And in terms right. of the makeup uh, of those portfolios, if you uh, if you can share a little bit sure. of that. Or yeah, no, absolutely. So it ranges from like we're agnostic and asset class. So one of the things Rodrigo and I've talked about ad nauseum in the past is I look at investing as tools in a toolbox. Right. So if you need to build a house, you need more than just a hammer. So from our side, that'll range from, you know, long term U.S. treasuries to gold to, you know, for some people who want it, cannabis, it could be, um, you know, emerging market bonds, like literally infrastructure, anything under the sun. So if it's an investable asset that we're, that's traded on any major market, we will do our best to be able to have it as part of the portfolio. Now that doesn't mean it's gonna get weighted in any given point in time. That's a separate topic because of the target vol, but the universe, which is the only subjective part of my process has in general about 40 securities. Some of them are privates uh, that are non-correlated to the market and that's by design. And then the rest of them are publicly traded, typically larger broad-based indices that range from fixed income all the way to you know specialty equities. Any crypto? Uh, no, because technically not a security. So uh, until that changes. Uh, uh, is that a Raymond James thing? Uh, no, it's more of a Shiraz thing, to be honest. But like, I haven't seen a good way to play it. I think blockchain is a brilliant technology, but none of these things are working yet. 
right? So I will believe it all when I see it. So that's kind of that, my, that's my a whole bit. other episode. I don't know how, how much time we have to go down that rabbit. Well, we have five. I, I have one. I, look, we, we're almost at an hour, but I, I do want to ask you one question that sure. I, I, we talked about it years ago. <clears throat> and I and I remember when we were talking about this, you were in the, the bullion management group. And yeah. the whole idea with y- your partners there was that you wanted to invest with them and pay a higher MER because they're absolutely bonkers. And they literally like built a place where they held the gold. Am I, am I right in remembering that? No, they're using Scotia Picada, but that was actually a plan. They wanted to build their own facility. They, that's what it was. They wanted to build their own facility. And this is like the world's going to end. They want to seal our gold. We're going to have this gold in an island and that's where we're going to create it. How much, like you're a gold guy, you've been in this space for, for a good period of time. We always have fun discussions, but how much value is there really? Like, is, is there really this idea of GLD, right? Um, not being able to have fungibility, like do they do they or do they not actually have gold in their vaults versus groups like BMG or Sprott that claim to have full uh, access to their gold pieces. Is this a true concern? Like, do you still hold that opinion that it is crucial to have the physical gold separate from, um, um, you know, from instead of market using exposure. contracts or market exposure? Uh, it, it frankly depends on what you're looking to accomplish, right? So for people who are concerned about the sky falling, then frankly, beans, bullets, and bunkers, right? Those types of people, possessions nine tenths of the, of the law. So obviously that matters. And look, it, this is just a reality. There's a finite amount of gold and there's a big misconception, you know, arguably 160,000 tons, maybe 20 cubic meters worth in volume if you're to melt into one giant cube. So it's actually not a lot, it's like a small swimming pool. That's why one ounce is worth what, almost 2000 bucks, right? So there is just not enough metal deliverable. Wait, did I hear that right? You're saying that all of the gold in the world fits into one swimming pool? Roughly. 20 cubic meter. Now, super heavy, right? That's all the gold that's ever been mined in all of that history. Is a, that is a neat stat. I like that. I'm going to use yeah, that it's, one. It's a weird stat okay. when you think about it, but 20 cubic meters is like, you know, it's not even an Olympic sized pool, right? So it's, there's not that much. And there is true scarcity. The single largest holders of gold on the planet are central banks, and they physically take possession for the most part. Uh, Asia has been, China has been buying it like by the droves for a bunch of years. Um, so yeah, I mean, for some people, if you care about owning physical gold, then yes, it matters. Right. But for 99% of people, they just care about the price movement of gold. That's when it doesn't matter as much. Right. So if you're just looking at as an asset allocation, because the reality is the circumstances we're having, the physical will matter means the rest of your portfolio is absolutely destroyed. So that five or 10% that you had is really not going to do much. Yeah, right. for the zombie apocalypse, you need seeds, bullets, and water, right? Totally. It's, it's, it's a little bit of gold. gold. Yeah, gonna... that gold and maybe do some bartering. Yeah, yeah totally. Right? Look, it's, it's really? valuable. I think you should I always have bullets and guns. Guys. I've got your gold. Totally. <laughs> got yeah. your gold. Wait, exactly. Got, your gold. Right. I've got my bullets well, and guns. If you have too much physical on you, right? All somebody's going to do, somebody bigger than you is going to turn you upside down and just shake you until it all falls out, right? That's so, what he means. That, that's what Mike <laughs> means. I, just, I find He's the whole bigger. physical, unless you're owning it yourself, but this idea of some other company owning it for you if if that's the case if the the only time you're going to need it is when nothing else is working what are the chances you're going to be able to travel to this place and and claim your gold bullion bar or that they will actually be able to deliver it to your country that is confiscating that gold i just i think it's either you own it in your own vault in many places around the planet so that you can actually get access to it nobody knows where it is or if you need it from an asset allocation perspective you buy it in in an instrument but this middle part is I just have a hard time paying, you know, two, three times the cost uh, to, to have the illusion of control there. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're not wrong. And for some people it'll end up being semantics, right? So I, I'd say that there's a percentage of the population that that matters, right? Is knowing that the essence of the contract behind it, it's as secure as you can do every measurable movement that you're capable of to secure your position, right? And for some people, that's worth paying more for. Right. It's just that that knowledge and knowing that I did everything in my power to get the most secure product possible. As for some people, that's all that they care. Other people who just, you know what, I just want to get the benefit of the price movement. I want something that's going to give me the lowest tracking error. Well, then a GLD might be a perfect fit. Right. So I call them different ends of the spectrum. They're not the same product for the same person. They're for different people. Right. So like a true good advisor. It's all about values. Right. Okay, what are your man. values? Let's fit, let's fit them to your values. Different strokes for different folks, man. So like ultimately what is the right thing for them? 
right? And just give them what they need. Put it in the back of my pickup truck with my fishing rods and my guns. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, uh, Shiraz, that, that was great, man. Um, you uh, you've clearly come a long way. You're you're a trailblazer, which I've always appreciated, and uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast and and sharing your thoughts with everyone. Oh, my pleasure. It's a, a pleasure. It's a YouTube. The yes, the live you YouTube. Keep calling what are you calling it a, it? Is it a live cast? I don't, I don't Next week it. it's podcast. YouTube live it's cast. It's because there's a mic in front of a live them. stream. Podcast. I don't That's know. What's going on. We can talk about that for another hour too. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Totally. No, it was it was awesome. Thank you guys for having me, and I'd love to come back at some point. So that'd be awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, this was All great, right, man. Cool. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you Remember, too. pause here. Don't leave anybody yeah, don't, don't until leave the red yet. light goes.